I will assume that I'm making a sufficient amount of noise here to be heard by all persons. If not, please do indicate in some way. The title of this paper, as Roy correctly noted, is Perspectives on the Problem of Evil. As it happened last night, my wife noted that it's actually a somewhat inaccurate title, um, and I wish I had called it rather Perspectives on Suffering. Because in fact, as it turns out, really, I only talk about one perspective on the problem of evil, but I talk about two perspectives on suffering. And therefore, to justify the uh, pluralization of the first word of the title, uh, I need another word to serve as an object of the preposition on, perspectives on suffering. Is what this paper, therefore, is about, even though that may not serve officially. I'm interested, interested in, in uh, uh, commenting on a certain phenomenon uh, to be observed in people's reactions to suffering. It is well known that suffering is an effective motive for atheism. For I just noted, of course, that it is the basis of an argument against the existence of God. What I want to comment on tonight, though, and study a little bit and think about is also suffering has tended to be a very uh, effective stimulus to faith in the existence of God. And it seems to point both ways in a very peculiar fashion. Number one on the handout is just an example of a very poignant, moving, profound kind of suffering. An example of a couple which loses their only child who is very young at time of death. <clears throat> now, in number two, I mentioned that there are two possible reactions to this event. Indeed, I'm sure there are many, but here are two generic reactions. The first of which is commonly noted and frequently philosophized about. 2A. They may be driven to rejection of the very notion what interests me, however, is the existence of to be. They may be driven to acceptance of the very notion of God. And they may actually be impelled into a belief that God exists as a result of the suffering which they have experienced. Now, those of you with extensive pastoral experience, and I know that there are many of those present, I believe will acknowledge the commonness of the second kind of reaction. I remember when as a kid I was sent to Christian camps, uh, we would have sometimes a fire night, and the counselors would get up and give testimonials, i.e. explain how they came to acquire their religious faith. And I've heard testimonials over the years in that kind of context and other kinds of contexts, and I have to say I haven't heard a lot of testimonials that have taken this form. I haven't heard a lot of people saying, you know, I really was enjoying my life and having a fabulous time. And then I gave my heart to Christ. <laughs> I had everything I wanted, and life was exciting and wonderful. And then I opened my heart to the Lord. I have not heard testimonials of that kind. That's not really a common way to enter the faith. Well, I'm sure that such things have happened. Frequently enough. But it seems to me that far from being an unusual event in one's history of conversion, coming to a belief in the existence of God through an experience of suffering is, in fact, uh, quite a normal kind of event. Number three on the handout 2A, that is to say, the reaction described therein to an experience of suffering is expressed at a philosophical level by what is known as the problem of evil. <coughs> Here's the problem of evil. God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent. God's omnipotence means that God is all-powerful. God's omniscience means that God is all-knowing. God's omnibenevolence means that God is all-loving. So if God is all Powerful, God is able to make a world without suffering. And if God is all-knowing, God knows how to do so. And if God is all-loving, then God has motive to do so. 
And yet there is suffering in the world, which means that either God is not all loving, or God is not all knowing, or God is not all powerful, or God, as previously described, is plain, does not exist. The problem of evil. And that statement of the problem of evil expresses at a high, general, abstract, philosophical level what's undergone by the person who, as a result of experience of terrible suffering, loses their faith and is no longer able to believe in the existence of God. So reaction 2A is expressed philosophically by the problem of evil. Here's my question this evening. Is there a philosophical argument which also expresses the basic content of 2B? If somebody, as a result of suffering, comes to accept the existence of God, is there a philosophical argument that expresses how that can be so? What I want to do this evening is suggest that indeed there is. It's an argument that was advanced by Immanuel Kant, and which is a, a matter of some complexity and will require some careful development over time, of which I have some of us in an hour. That's what I hope to accomplish in that amount of time. Number four in the handout. Maybe there is not a credible expression at a philosophical level of 2B, however. I, maybe what I'm attempting to do tonight is absolutely a waste of time, is unforthcoming. Maybe believing in God in the face of suffering is just a form of therapy. And this, I think, is what many people will suspect. And something which I think in many cases is true. You're plunged into a despair. You cling desperately at anything that will give you a hope in the face of that despair, even if it's something that is seemingly irrational. It's something which in your right mind you would never actually accept. Maybe coming to theism as a result of the prompting of the experience of suffering is just a form of therapy. Often, I guess it is. But I want to say, too, that very often being plunged into atheism is a form of therapy, too. Read the Vatican sayings or, uh, of, of Epicurus or Lucretius's uh, On the Nature of Things. Both of these men wax eloquently about the advantages of either not believing in God or not believing that God cares about human beings. They wax eloquently about the advantages to your life if you're not feeling superstition and you're not feeling that with every step God is looking over your shoulder and judging you. Epicurus very much presents atheism or something to that effect as a form of therapy, as a form of improving your life. So on both sides, 2A and 2B, we can accuse somebody who takes that movement of the mind of doing nothing but undergoing a therapy. The question is, can we see sometimes in that motion of the mind something above and beyond therapy, something that constitutes a real philosophical position and a real philosophical argument. So number five gives a little bit of an outline of what I'm going to do. <clears throat> a, I'm going to discuss theism and look at an argument that destabilizes it. This is really just kind of warm-up material. It's showing how, at a philosophical level, you can understand 2A. And then what I'm going to do, and here I express this in 5B, is move in the other direction. I'm going to start with a, a very hard-bitten, hardcore atheist and show how that position can then lead one in the other direction and show how, in both cases, what makes the movement happen is an experience of suffering. Number six on the handout, a final comment about suffering itself. Not all forms of suffering are problematic. Not all forms of suffering are difficult to justify. Not all forms of suffering are inconsistent with the notion that God exists. We make ourselves suffer all the time. But so long as we think there's something forthcoming from the suffering, we're okay with that. It's not any old kind of suffering that provokes crisis. It's useless suffering, suffering that doesn't seem to lead anywhere, suffering 
that doesn't seem to have a purpose or a meaning. So in particular, the phenomenon that I'm going to be studying and thinking about is the problem of useless suffering, such as a couple losing their only child who was very young at the time of death. What useful thing could come from such an event? What could be attained in the face of such a loss? I turn to section A. For a classic statement of theism, let us turn to Augustine. Number eight on the handout. Quotation from Augustine on free will. <clears throat> Say this is said, it would not have been difficult or laborious for Almighty God to have seen to it that all his creatures should have observed their proper order so that none of them should have come to misery. Right? That's the person who's posing the problem of evil. Why didn't God make a world in which there was no misery? If God was so great, why did that not happen? Here's the argument then, an adumbrated version of the one that I gave a moment ago, which itself is an adumbrated version of much longer ones. If he is omnipotent, says this voice, that would not have been beyond his power to have so created the world. And if he is good, he would not have wretched it. And then Augustine answers this voice. He says, this is my answer. He says, the order of creatures proceeds from top to bottom by just grades, so that it is the remark of envy to say, that creature should not exist. And equally so to say, that one should be different. What Augustine is doing here is answering the problem of natural evil. The evil that is inherent in the natural world. The imperfection that is to be found in the world in which we live. Why are there slugs and lower life forms? Why are things imperfect? Why not make everything? Augustine has a profound faith in the superb orderedness of all that is. And he asserts what he calls the principle of plenitude, or sorry, what other, others call the principle of plenitude in speaking about him. And uh, I give a brief summary of that principle in the very last line of eight. Variety of form within the created universe is an intrinsic good. And the principle of plenitude basically says this, the more variety of forms there are in a created universe, the better the universe is. And so things needed to be created at greater and lesser grades of perfection simply because that's what was needed in order to meet the demands of this principle and therefore to make this universe as perfect as it possibly could be. So that's a superb expression of Augustine's faith in the absolute orderedness the absolute well-createdness of the universe. Number nine in the handout addresses the issue of moral evil. Augustine gives us in number eight an account of why there is evil in the world. Why is there evil now in human beings? He says this. <clears throat> For God would never have created any, I do not say angel, but even man whose future wickedness he foreknew, unless he had equally known to what uses on behalf of the good he could turn him, thus embellishing the course of the ages, as it were an exquisite poem set off with antitheses. So a beautiful poem sometimes unfolds as a series of contrasts or antitheses. And likewise, in God's carefully conceived history of the universe, Actions unfold as a series of contrasts, contrasts of good and evil. And those all, good and evil alike, serve the purposes of God. So at the end of the day, we in our imperfect state may not be able to say much about those purposes and may not be able to look much more deeply than the skin of this world, the mere appearance of it. We may not see deeply into it at all, but we, following Augustine, can have a profound faith that everything in this universe is created with a view to 
establishing and maintaining the perfect order that God intended to exist therein. Number 10 on the handout. A stable theism will always appeal to a deeper, even if unknown, purpose in the actions of things. And in the light of such an appeal, there will seem to be no useless suffering. And why does that child die mentioned in number one? We don't know. But Augustine invites us to have faith nonetheless that it was in accordance with the purposes of God, even if they are utterly incomprehensible to our level minds. <clears throat> number 12 begins now the second stage of my examination of arguments. Here we look at an argument to destabilize this comfortable faith and the equilibrium of it that we have just observed. The argument I take from Hume is dialogues concerning natural religion. Augustine has very clearly indicated there is no useless suffering. Now look at what Hume says at the outset of this quotation. Of the causes of evil, he says, none of them appear to human reason in the least degree necessary or unavoidable. Nor can we suppose them such without the utmost license, i.e. excess, of imagination. For Hume, the world is full of unnecessary evils. The world is full of useless suffering. And he doesn't just say that, of course, he tries to prove it. Number 13 gives us an example of the kind of reasoning that he appeals to in way of providing such a proof. Let me indicate a little bit about it and its content before I read it. Why is there pain? Why do we feel pain in our limbs? What possible use could pain be? Well, there's an easy answer to that lean on the side of a very hot stove. If you didn't feel pain in your hand when you did that, you'd burn your hand. You'd destroy your hand. you feel, on the other hand, a little bit of pain, you'd dry your hand away really quickly. Your hand, though sore, is saved. And that is the merit of pain. Now, Hume is complaining that if there really was a God, and God really is as great as people say, why didn't it occur to God to design us a little bit differently? Instead of feeling pain on touching the stove, why don't we just feel the absence of pleasure? And why doesn't God make us so that we have pleasure in our limbs all the time? We're always feeling pleasure throughout our body. And then when we touch the hot stove, all we feel is a cessation of pleasure, and we don't feel the stinging sensation of pain. Now, wouldn't that make life much easier, more pleasant, more wonderful for us? And God could have done it. God could have enhanced our survivability in just the way he did by bestowing upon us capacity for pain without actually going to the lengths of bestowing upon us the capacity for pain. And if God was always cracked up to be, why didn't God do this? That's what Hume is saying in number 13, to which I shall now turn. All animals might be constantly in a state of enjoyment but when urged by any of the necessities of nature, such as thirst, hunger, weariness, instead of pain, they might feel a diminution of pleasure, by which they might be prompted to seek that object which is necessary to their subsistence. So why do I have to feel pain to indicate that I'm hungry? Why can't I just be always in a state of pleasure in my stomach and then have it stop at the moment when my body is signaling to me that it's time to eat. Number 14 indicates some remaining aspects in which God, it seems, could have, in a simple way, created the world far better than he did. God could have made Hitler fall out of a tree when he was 10, break his neck. God could have done that to Stalin. God could have done that to Genghis Khan. Name the top 20 tyrants and murderers of all time. You know, big time killers. If God took out 20, 30 of those maybe, 
by means of advantageous fallings of the trees. When these people were ten, God could have saved without too much divine intervention at all, maybe a billion human lives. And if God is so great, why didn't God do this? God's not having done something God could so easily have done, truly, makes us say that this world is full of unnecessary and useless suffering because it was all avoidable. Number 15 on the handout, and this finishes my treatment of Hume's argument whose intent is to destabilize the kind of theistic position we have seen that Augustine adopts. Number 15. God could have made an entirely functional universe with less suffering in it than is now the case. Maybe not with no suffering, but with less than at present. So we have to say, look at the present amount and then consider the tiny amount that God could have created the world in such a way as to have. The difference between those two amounts is the amount of useless suffering that exists in the world. I'll read the second sentence number 15. The greater amount of suffering in this universe, compared to this hypothetical one that God could have created, is thus useless. And this brings either God's nature or existence into question and explains the reaction referred to in 2A. Let me just flip back and look at 2A again, just to make sure that this is a familiar notation and you understand how I'm tying the arguments together. 2A, remember, is the reaction to this example of suffering, which has people being driven to rejection of the very notion of God. Now I've said I'm really interested in studying 2B. The point of looking at 2A and 2B is to study whether or not there are actual substantive, general, philosophical arguments corresponding to these two faith experiences. And I think it's pretty clear that there's a very solid, a very substantive philosophical argument corresponding to 2A. We've just looked at it, the problem of evil. Now, let's look at what might correspond to 2B. To that end, I'm going to go back to where I was in the handout before I flipped back, and I'd like to take you actually to 16. see that in this presentation is a certain symmetry. We're going to go backwards now along the same course that I just went forwards on. And we're going to start from a position of atheism and utter suffering and despair as experienced from an atheistic perspective and see how that might lead one back the other direction to adopt a theistic conclusion. I'm going to adopt uh, Nietzsche's very classic statement of atheism. Nietzsche may be the most famous atheist of all. He certainly produced the most famous atheistic utterance of all. God is dead, he said. Incidentally, about that particular utterance, it doesn't just mean God doesn't exist. To understand that statement is to understand not only that it's expressing Nietzsche's atheism, but also that it's expressing his perspectivism. What's perspectivism? Well, it's a theory of truth. It's a theory of truth that contains both pragmatist and relativist elements. And here how is how it works. For Nietzsche, there's no absolute truth. There's only truth for you and truth for me. Relativism. But what truth for you is is a belief that if you hold it, gives you more power and makes you more successful. I might hold that belief and not become more powerful and successful as a result of doing so, in which case, that belief is not true for me. In the old days, if you were a member of a tribe and you were running out to battle, okay, and you believed that God was there and smiling upon your fortunes and on your side, and you went into battle with this belief, okay, you would throw your spear more forcefully, you would kill people more effectively, you would fight more passionately, and you'd have
have a better chance of surviving yourself. So for you, God exists. That statement was true in that context because it was a useful statement. But Nietzsche believes now in the modern era it's no longer useful to believe in God. If anything, it's the opposite. It no longer enhances our power to believe in God and to feel guilt and to feel that God is looking over us and judging us. Quite the opposite. Belief in God is no longer power enhancing. It's no longer useful. And therefore, it's no longer true for any of us. God exists, used to be true, but it's not true now. And that means God has gone from a position of existing for us to not existing. And what that means is God was alive at one time, but now God. Thus the words of history's most famous atheist. Number 17 is the first of two citations that I have for him. I will read the first sentence and then comment upon it. The total character of the world is in all eternity chaos. In the sense not of a lack of necessity, but a lack of order, arrangement, form, beauty, wisdom, and whatever other names there are for our aesthetic anthropomorphisms. Look at the first six words. And then what's said about what they refer to. The total character of the world is in all eternity chaos. Take the word chaos, plug in the word order, and you've got Augustine. This is a direct challenge, refutation, a direct contradiction of Augustine's deepest beliefs of the world. Look at the end of that sentence, the phrase aesthetic anthropomorphisms. Anthropomorphism, of course, is the state of mind whereby you impute to non-human things human qualities, which we do, for example, when we look up at the sky during the storm and say it's an angry sky. Aesthetic anthropomorphisms are what I refer to here. Nietzsche is saying that what we do is impute to the world all the things about ourselves that we find most beautiful. We like to think our thoughts in an ordered way. We like to arrange our thoughts. We have certain forms perceive with our thoughts. We make judgments of beauty. We see in ourselves wisdom. All of these things which we hold so highly in ourselves, we impute to the world. And we say there is beauty in the world. And we say there is form and wisdom and arrangement and order in the world. We impute to the world anthropomorphically mere figments of ourselves. What he's saying, therefore, is that those who believe there's really beauty in the world are subject to an illusion. Beauty in the world is merely a projection of that which exists only within ourselves. And the same with goodness, and the same with truth, and the same with any of these ideas that motivate us, these aesthetic anthropomorphisms. Let me take you to the second sentence in that citation. I shall not read. Judged from the point of view of our reason, unsuccessful attempts are by all odds the rule. The exceptions are not the secret aim, and the whole musical box repeats eternally its tune, which may be never called a melody. What's he denying? You're going through a period of crisis and you go to your mother for some advice and she says, patting you on the back. It will all come out well in the end. <clears throat> Things will turn out. They always do. It's that kind of attitude that Nietzsche is attacking here. The happy ending conception of life. 
which for the most part, as cynical as we may think ourselves, we do adopt. Because we go about our daily, weekly business. We work hard. And we do so in the expectation of gaining the fruits of our labors. You really do believe things will turn out well somehow. Else you would be plunged into a paralyzing despair. And it's this kind of confidence that Nietzsche is attempting to undermine. He says, and I'm going back in the sentence now and anatomizing it a little bit, judge from the point of view of our reason. I, if we really think about this stuff, and we don't just follow <coughs> our casual <coughs> illusions, <coughs> unsuccessful attempts are by all odds the rule. Think about it. Most of what's undertaken in life doesn't come to pass. Most of human experience, if you think about it, is failure. And it is merely shrouded in this illusion of success. <coughs> the exceptions are not the secret aim. When things happen in a way that seems sudden, unusual, surprising, there's not a secret aim here. There's not a God who's intervening and doing these special things. There's no secret aim. There's no aim. And there's no secret. There's nothing profound and metaphysically removed in this earth. I say at the bottom of that quotation, the universe is fundamentally lacking order and lacking, and here's the more important point that I really want to establish in talking about Nietzsche and his atheism, and lacking intrinsic value. Right? For Nietzsche, the principle of plenitude, as typifying Augustine's thought, would be nothing but another one of those anthropomorphic, sorry, aesthetic anthropomorphisms. Let's go on to number 18. There's no good, there's no evil, there's no right, there's no wrong. There's no basis for praising the universe. There's no basis for finding fault with it. The young child dies. That's neither good nor bad. How could it be? There is no good. There is no bad. I quote, How could we reproach or praise the universe? Let us beware of attributing to it heartlessness and rude reason, or their opposites. It is neither perfect nor beautiful nor noble, nor does it wish to become any of these things. There's no animating principle in the universe that is making it drive itself toward the attainment of these higher qualities because they don't even exist. None of our aesthetic and moral judgments apply to it. So, there is no basis for feeling aggrieved or even surprised at inexplicable events of suffering, as I say at the end of number 18 in the hand of the universe is not constructed in such a way as to keep these from arising. There are no values. <clears throat> That's the atheistic perspective. Very hard to argue that there are objective values when you do not say that there is God. And indeed, the statement that God does not exist and the statement that values do not exist have gone hand in hand in the development of the modern viewpoint. So this is not only a statement of atheism, it's a fair statement of atheism and a fair statement of the valuelessness that results from that perspective. Number 19. Stable atheism will reject the idea of an all encompassing, deeper purpose in the actions of things. In light of this rejection, it is accepted beyond question that there is useless suffering. I'm now going to begin the transition to this argument, which I will describe as a destabilizing atheism argument, an argument that destabilizes this atheistic position. 
an argument that makes it more difficult, maybe for some maximally difficult, to continue to maintain this position. It's a complicated argument, not nearly so simple and elegant as the problem of evil. So it takes a little bit longer to develop. But now what I'm starting to do is develop the argument that I see as constituting a philosophical formalization of 2B. Remember 2B. It is the reaction to this example of the dying child, which involves not a turning away from God, but a turning toward God. How could that happen? Here, maybe, is how it could. I want to think about this atheistic and valueless perspective. Here's a question about it. How readily is this viewpoint maintained? In a context where there are no values, where is the lasting, significant good for which we may strive. We all live lives, we all have goals, sometimes quite complicated goals. Think about those goals. You are making considerable efforts for the purpose of achieving those goals. They may not be really precisely articulated, but you do have a sense of doing the things you do for some kind of purpose. Okay, now, time to take seriously the atheistic perspective which tells you not only that God doesn't exist, but there are no values, good or evil, right or wrong, in this universe. <clears throat> so why are you trying to bring about the thing that you are trying to bring about in your life, this plan that you have? What is the significance of it? You can't say it's a good thing to do, or the right thing to do. When you are dead, All that is left of your life is this thing or set of things that you've brought about in the course of your life. What is the significance then of you and your life in comparison with the significance of a person who lived for five years and then perished? Because you can say, well, I accomplished more than this other person because how in a valueless universe where there's no goodness or badness, rightness or wrongness, or indeed to continue the list, there's no beauty and there's no order. How can you make a case for saying that you have accomplished anything at all? How can you have a purpose in this kind of life? An atheist will frequently accuse a theist of illusion. But then the theist can say to an atheist, look, you're continuing to live your life. You're continuing to strive. I see you do it. What is the basis, the ground, for the purpose for which you strive? If as a result of your atheism, you have no values in terms of which you can say of this thing, this thing is good. Because there are no values to maximize in this world, it means that all the suffering that you have is by definition useless. And there is none that is not useless. There is none that serves a purpose. But you say, perhaps, the maximization of pleasure. I had pleasure along the way. OK, you have pleasure along the way. And then you die. What about the five-year-old who did not have so much pleasure? What's the difference right now when you and that five-year-old who died uh, are both dead? What is the significance of a transient and impermanent goal? Well, that's a hard question. And indeed, I think, probably an impossible one to answer. A transient goal is one which disappears as soon as achieved. And what's the difference then between having achieved it and not having done so? Number 21. <laughs> I ask, are people actually able to maintain this viewpoint? Well, what I actually mean there is Camus' question with which he begins the myth of Sisyphus. Are people who properly adopt this perspective able not to commit suicide, given that there is no discernible purpose which they can argue in a rational way to attach to their lives? 
22, 23, 24 on this handout are all expressions of this point. Camus, who himself is writing this as an atheist, is saying, if you only take off your blinders and you look at the world, you will see that in a godless world, there is absolutely nothing but absurdity in the striving of a human life. So let me point out that the argument that I just made in connection with 20 and 19 is not the argument just of a theist reflecting not very flatteringly upon atheism. It's also the argument, indeed chiefly the argument, of an atheist doing so. And I say that because, in fact, I got it from Camus. Number 22. Living naturally is never easy. You continue making the gestures commanded by existence for many reasons, the first of which is habit. Dying voluntarily implies that you have recognized even instinctively the ridiculous character of that habit, the absence of any profound reason for living, the insane character of that daily agitation, and the uselessness of suffering. So Camus is complaining that we evidence in our lives a habit-induced unawareness of the deeper truths of our predicament. Look, say you buy a bag of potato chips and you eat the potato chips. What do you do with a bag? Crumple it up, you throw it away. Why? Because it's useless. Now, if you could discern some use for a potato chip bag, you'd keep it. Anything that you truly believe to be useless, you'd throw away. But if there are no deeper purposes in life, which there cannot be if there are no deeper values, then it is not consistent to do anything other than with your life than you would do with the potato chip bag once you had consumed its contents. Throw yourself away. Commit suicide. And Kevin was saying, you know, if you take away the blinders and you look at the world in the spirit of realism, you'll understand it makes no sense to do other than to contemplate committing suicide. Number 23. What then is that incalculable feeling that deprives the mind of the sleep necessary to life? Sleep necessary to life? The illusion that most people seem to have to maintain in order to keep living. People have to be asleep to these truths, he says, or they would commit suicide. <coughs> I continue, second sentence. A world that can be explained even with bad reasons is a familiar world. And here he's actually making a comment of a slighting nature, nature about theism itself. Right? Even if you've got some bad reasons that somehow make the world seem familiar and at home, a place where you can feel comfortable and have a purpose, you'll find that condition more supportable. But on the other hand, he says, to read the third sentence of that citation. In a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, where the beautiful, comforting illusion of your life is suddenly stripped away and you see the world grimly for what it really is, man, he says, feels an alien, a stranger. Right? He's appealing here to the Marxist conception of unhappiness. Unhappiness for Marx is alienation. It's being separated in Marx's case, uh, from the materials upon which you labor in a factory. It's feeling apart, it's feeling alone, it's feeling not involved. And that's what Camus says is our true state. We're not involved in this world in which we have no purpose. I continue then with that quotation. His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land hope in the land, there are metaphors for a place where when you go to it, you have a function, you have a purpose. It's a place that's full of things for you to do, full of functions for you to carry out. This divorce between man and his life, he finishes, I, I finish that quotation with this, 
of the actor and his setting is properly the feeling of absurdity. Imagine an actor in full dress and full regalia uh, declaiming their lines and then the stage sets around them toppling over and you just see the back of the theater and the bricks and the high-tech equipment. It looks ridiculous all of a sudden, stripped of context to see the actor that in the funny costume and saying funny lines. That's what we see ourselves as being like when we discover the essential purposelessness of our standing in this world. Number 24, finally the issue of suicide here is broached. Suicide has never been dealt with except as a social phenomenon, i.e. people don't think of suicide for what it is, a profound philosophical statement by somebody who has woken up over time and realized that their life means nothing. It's an emptied potato chip bag kind of thing in its degree of uselessness. And they've decided consistently with their insights to throw it away. And this act is philosophical, it's deep, it's artistic. On the contrary, he continues, we are concerned here with the relationship between individual thought and suicide. An act like this is prepared within the silence of the heart. This is a great work of art. The man himself is ignorant of it. One evening, he pulls the trigger, or drunk jumps, of an apartment building manager who had killed himself. I was told that he had lost his daughter five years before, that he had changed greatly since, and that that experience had undermined him. A more exact word cannot be imagined. Beginning to think is beginning to be undermined. In number 25 then, I start to assert this argument that I think is starting to emerge from these considerations, how an atheistic viewpoint can react to an experience of extreme suffering in such a way as to be uh, propelled to a position of theism. Number 25. Unless we can be reconciled to this thoroughgoing atheistic viewpoint, which invites suicide, we will need a way of explaining how our lives are not just sequences of acts of useless suffering. Right? So, you want to take an intellectually rigorous position on these kinds of issues. You've either got to accept that your life is utterly meaningless, has no purpose, and then try to explain to me why you're not committing suicide. Or if you can't quite go that far, the other intellectually rigorous position is to try to explain to me, more importantly to yourself, how your life is not just a sequence of acts of suffering, useless and Next sentence in 25. We will need a way of explaining how the suffering we undergo is for something, is purpose of in character, and therefore not useless. We will need to be able to conceptualize life as a program of attainment in order to be able to endure it. And this finally brings me to the argument of Kant. In order to understand your life as a program of as a sequence of events in which you do hard stuff and you get something out of doing it sooner or later. In order to understand your life in that fashion, Kant argues, you have to believe in God. So let me now turn to this argument. First I have a statement of the argument somewhat informally caught in my own terms, that's 27. Then there's a closer paraphrase of the argument, which I have taken from the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, page 10. That's 28. And then <clears throat> in 29, we have a statement of Kant's argument itself, or some portion of it, from the section of his Critique of Practical Reason entitled the second postulate of practical reason. Number 27. 
First of all, Kant starts with the idea of the highest good. He uses this idea a lot. And basically, all he's saying in his argument is, there's nowhere in nature we can credibly derive the idea of the highest good. We can only get it if we believe in God. Therefore, God exists. Or at any rate, we have to believe in God. Let me explain something about this idea of the highest good. I've uh, glossed it in a couple of different ways in 27. I've called it the ultimate goal of human existence. Uh, that's a little bit too highfalutin. It's a little bit too impressive sounding. It, it's a much more homespun notion than that. I've also called it moral goodness met with happiness. And it's even more homespun than that. What Kant means by the highest good is simply that something like this. You get out of life what you put into it. You do your duty and you'll get something back that you like and that makes you happy. And what Kant is saying is, and what I think from looking at these two atheists, we can conclude, if you don't have a conception like that, then you've either got to live a life of consistent illusion, or you've got big time despair ahead of you, and if you're really consistent about it, you'll kill yourself. So when we talk about the highest good in this context, please understand it's a very homespun notion. It's the notion that if you put out an effort, you do your duty, you'll get something in the form of happiness. Now the whole point is, if you're at all realistic and you look at the world, there's nothing about the world that tells you that's a credible idea because we see all the time that it doesn't happen. That people put out an effort and they get something back. Lots of people get stuff back who put out no effort and don't do their duty. Lots of people do their duty and seem to get the worst, not the best, in the way of happiness as a result of it. We can't function in our lives without this notion of the highest good. But life itself doesn't teach us this notion. We don't get it from nature. It seems, in fact, a piece of foolery if we try to derive it from nature. And ultimately, we can only ground a faith, an acceptance, a belief along these lines by accepting the existence of God, says Kant. So let me now read through number 27, which is me, speaking about Kant. <clears throat> Kant starts with the idea of the highest good. Remember this homespun idea, getting out of life, or maybe of afterlife, what you put into life. For this idea to be motivational, right, for this idea really to stimulate you to make real efforts in getting through life, and working hard, and doing your duty on a constant basis, <clears throat> And for it not just to be an attractive idea, a Pulp Fiction kind of idea, it must be incredible. You've got to be able really to believe how the idea could be so. But nothing in the universe as we experience it makes this idea credible. We need the idea of God in order to make it so. And we thus need the idea of God in order to believe that those who are morally good will receive due happiness. Highfalutin way of saying those who do their duty in life will get some kind of reward in way of happiness. That no one will suffer in vain, that there is no useless suffering. Number 28 gives us a closer paraphrase of the Kantian argument. Quote, the highest good consists of perfect virtue rewarded with perfect happiness. If morality is to command the allegiance of reason, right, if your sense of doing your duty is going to be credible to you and is going to present itself to you as something that's reasonable to follow and obey, then the highest good must be a real possibility. Nature and its laws do not furnish such a guarantee. 
So practical reason is justified in positing a supernatural agent. By practical reason, he just means that aspect of the use of human reason which has to do with questions of right and wrong. And now of 29, we get to the argument, which I hope I have explained well enough to make it comprehensible, just basically with my reading through it. The argument which I really advertise is the point of my presentation here this evening. The argument which I think expresses at a philosophical level exactly what I've been trying to find as corresponding to 2B. Remember 2B. 2B at the very beginning is that reaction to the death of the child, which takes the form not of rejecting the existence of God, but accepting the existence of God. How is it that suffering can make you accept the idea of God? Well, the point of my presentation has been to suggest that the experience of useless suffering creates the kind of crisis expressed by Camus which itself creates a need for some kind of regulative idea, some kind of credible program of attainment in your life, some kind of highest good in this homespun sense, as I've explained it, which you need in order not to commit suicide or be plunged into utter despair in the face of that suffering, which you need in order to go on and to continue to exist. This is the argument that I think formalizes the experience of somebody who responds to suffering that seemingly is useless in a way that is affirmative of God. Number 29 on the handout. There is not the slightest ground in the moral law for a necessary connection between the morality, i.e. the doing of the duty, following the duty, and proportionate happiness of a being which belongs to the world as one of its parts and thus dependent on it. So the world doesn't teach us about this connection between doing your duty and somehow at the end of the process getting something out of it. The world teaches the opposite lesson. Not being nature's cause as will cannot by its own strength bring nature as it touches on his happiness into complete harmony with his practical principles. So this, these practical considerations, these considerations of morality, are not one that we, ones that we can bring into existence ourselves, our puny selves into nature. We're not big, we're not powerful enough. And to suppose that this highest good is achievable in nature, okay, we need to posit the existence of not a puny creature like ourselves, but of a great and a magnificent, a powerful creator like God. C in 29. Nevertheless, in the practical task of pure reason, <coughs> by which means the necessary <coughs> endeavor after the highest good, such a connection is postulated as necessary. We should seek to further the highest good. Okay, we should live this life where we put out an effort in the faith of receiving a reward. You know, it's a fundamental impetus in our very psychology. Therefore, also, the existence is postulated, this is D in 29, of a cause of the whole of nature itself distinct from nature, which contains the ground of the exact coincidence of happiness, of morality. And God is positive, therefore, as the great fixer, the one who will make it right, and will therefore make credible this belief we have that things will somehow be made right. As your mother told you while patting you on the back, things generally turn out well in the end. It'll all be okay. To make that a life perspective, the need for doing which arises in an experience of crisis-inducing, extreme and apparently useless suffering we need to posit the existence of God. E in 29. Therefore, the highest good is possible in the world only on the supposition of a supreme cause of nature which has a causality corresponding to the moral intention. So I'll 
It has a causal power and uses the causal power in a way that corresponds with our moral expectations of the way the world order should work, i.e. it should confer reward for duty done. And finally, F in this argument. As a consequence, the postulate of the possibility of a highest derived good, i.e. the best world, is at the same time the postulate of the reality of a highest original good, namely the existence of God. For the world to be the sort of world that we can continue to exist in and not have sent ourselves from through an experience of suicide, Kant is basically saying we have to have a conception of God. So that, it seems to me, is a philosophical expression of what goes on in a person's mind who having been confronted with an experience of severe suffering come to a state of belief. In my own extended family, too, years ago, a few minutes after my son was born, uh, a family member actually died, drowned. They cohabited the world for a few minutes, not many more. And my nephews were in the unusual position of gaining and losing uh, a cousin within the same hour. Within that family, there was a remarkable affirmation of faith. There was a baptism. There was, um, the case, in the case of this uh, person who underwent baptism, um, a channeling of his life into things divine. This kind of phenomenon is described to be really does happen. And what I'm suggesting is this kind of Kantian argument as I've tried to explain it. Studying it against the backdrop of existentialist uh, atheism, this Kantian argument really seems to be expressive of the mindset of a person who undergoes this process. Number 30, in way of conclusion. <clears throat> Suffering, when it's seemingly useless, presents mixed evidence about God. However, because I'm not, of course, now saying that the first uh, core section of this paper, section 8, does not exist. I'm continuing to say, of course, that suffering points in the direction of the non-existence of God, but also in the direction of the existence of God. Suffering is, in fact, a very profoundly ambiguous phenomenon, which points in both directions at the same time, which is why people, some of them, go in one of those two directions upon experiencing suffering, and others go in the other. I continue with number 30. It seems to convey an unlikelihood that God exists. It also seems to convey a need for us to believe that God exists. It suggests that God cannot exist and that God must exist. So it is ambiguous evidence at best. William James distinguishes between people who, in their concern for truth, try to maximize the number of truths that they believe at the risk of maybe inducing into, inducting into their belief set some falsehoods. And people who try to minimize error, minimize their belief set in such a way that they might end up ceasing to believe in statements which, if they had believed in, would have been true beliefs. In short, some people in their pursuit of truth are lovers of truth and others fear error. And that love and that fear can take you in different directions. And you can't say one is more rational than the other. But the people who react in the 2A fashion to an experience of suffering are like those who wish to make absolutely sure meticulously that they don't believe anything that might be false and so exclude from their belief set some statements that might end up, in fact, being true. And those who react to suffering in the 2B sense, those who are affirmative of the existence of God in the face of suffering, are like those who are more desirous of truth than they are of avoiding falsehood and are willing to, as it were, take a chance and bringing additional statements into their belief set, some of which might be false but for the purposes of, in the end, having as many correct beliefs as they possibly can. I'm pointing out in 30 and 31 that it's
it's rational, I guess, to let suffering point in one direction or the other. And I guess that's why different people take the one direction, different people take the other in their response to experiences of suffering. 32, the final item. So the reaction described in 2b does have its substantive philosophical counterpart, just as the reaction described in 2a does. And one thing I want to say in a way of concluding on this issue of the problem of evil is really this. What I've said here doesn't refute the argument made by people who assert the problem of evil. Because in fact, I'm not at all arguing in this paper that suffering and the prospect of useful suffering cannot serve as the ground for an argument for the non-existence of God. I'm not trying to sever that evidential link. And so I'm not refuting the argument inherent in what's called the problem of evil. But nonetheless, what I've said tonight is, in fact, a response to those who make that argument. While not severing their evidential link, what I am saying is, at the same time, there's another evidential link that perhaps they overlook. And that is the evidential link that, in fact, starts from that same, same evidence, but takes the person who views the evidence in the opposite direction. And what I'm saying, ultimately, not is, is not that evil is not something that can serve for some people as an argument against the existence of God. I'm saying that evil, useless suffering, is profoundly ambivalent evidence that can serve for others as an argument for the existence of God. It points Janus-like in both